Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flipped classroom and our continuing discussion of the growth of absolutism and constitutionalism in the 1600s in Europe, okay? So where we left off in class... Oh, wait. First of all, before we go any further, I gotta get make my face like real, real big just so I can tell you real fast. Y'all blew me away today in class. Absolutely blown away. That is exactly what I love my class to be every single day. Y'all enjoyed it. We had a good time. Y'all just kind of like, we talked about y'all requested songs. We talked about The Descendants, and now I've never seen it. It's absolutely awesome. Keep up the good work. I'm so impressed by all of you. Y'all, this AP group, y'all are like just, just growing up. You're doing great things, okay? Very impressed. But let's get after it real quick, and I'm going to clip in an old flip in about two seconds so y'all can kind of finish up the content because it's just really good. The one that I recorded like, like two years ago is just really, really good when it talks about the rise of the Bourbon dynasty. So the big thing about it, though, is we left off talking about the traits of an absolutist government, right? We got cut off by the bell a little bit, and you had to run out. And so we were talking about, first of all, the ABCDs of like absolutism, right? Absolutism being the A, and then the bureaucratic government or a multi-level government being the B, the centralized government or the being ruled from one key location being the C and then the divine right to rule which being the D okay now by the way again remember though divine right to rule is probably one of the most important premises of absolutism because it literally kind of ushers in the idea that these kings believe that God placed them there on purpose right that's also kind of en encouragingly gives them power over the church because they are claiming that God place them on the throne and that no man can take him off, right? So the going into it though as well, you can really, really see the growth of all these things, particularly when you're talking about the rise of the Bourbon dynasty, AKA the old Burgundians, all right? So like now, like so, big thing about it, all you need to know is they're known as the Bourbons, okay? Like now, the Bourbon dynasty will rise up in France and they really demonstrate to us a monarchy that has all of these things, right? We'll also talk about the Russians and stuff like that, the Romanov family in Russia that will rise up as well and they demonstrate the ABCDs of absolutism as well, but nobody does it like the French did, okay? Now, going into it, though, speaking of, we've got to talk about a couple of other practical elements of all absolutist leaders, okay? So every single absolutist leader did a couple of those things, right? One, another big thing they're going to do, they're going to increase infrastructure, they're going to build more roads and stuff like that. Two, they're going to focus on language barriers, and they're going to try and govern the people that they can actually communicate with. And then also, they're going to have that bureaucratic government, that centralized government, that divine right to rulership, right? The other thing that they're going to do, though, as well, is you need to understand what they're going to do with their military and the thing that we're talking about right now is just thematic things that most absolutists had, right? So the thing about it, first and foremost, to get away from that feudal style military, absolutist rulers are going to get make it vague. Blah, blah, blah. Our absolutist rule, let me start that over again. Rewind, calm down, breathe a second, Mr. Terry. You don't have to freak out and you don't have to ramble. It's okay. Absolutists are also going to usher in the concept of professional militaries. So we talked about this in class today. Feudal militaries are those funky little things where every single time you want to get a war, you would have to actually call up a noble, or a series of nobles actually. They would then collectively bring together a military, pay for it on their own, show up with the king with the promise of being able to loot, plunder, and get a piece of whatever they conquest and conquer, right? So the thing about it, though, is if the king who is rising up has enemies, those nobles that don't like him, that actually do live in his country but don't like him anyway— they aren't going to show up, and it's also, this can be elementally seen in things like the War of the Roses, because nobles don't also always necessarily get along, and also nobles oftentimes, before the reign of absolutists, believed that they were right on the same level as the absolutists themselves, or about on the kings themselves, right? Like, the Tudors rose up out of the Lancaster dynasty, right? Or, and then, literally, the Yorks were the other family. So the thing about it that we need to understand is that feudal military is very, very weak, and it kept kings weak for a really long time. But what instead is going to happen is absolutists are going to create what's known as professional militaries by raising a formal year-round paid military. This is going to start being when you see absolutists dress their militaries a certain way. They will all have in uniforms. They will all have certain weapons. They will all have standard issued like swords. They will all also be wear or like be in a system where also to try and get the nobles to be happy that like the absolutists will appoint the nobles as officers of the military. You see what I'm talking about here? The professional military aspect though then also gives the absolutists a military that can be deployed at any moment so they can go to war and grow their like land at any second. Okay. Army sizes in the 1600s are going to triple by comparison to what they were during the 1500s. They also are going to come in as well. Absolutists are going to come in and they heavily supported sciences and the growth of the scientific revolution that's going on in the background, just so you have to understand or a big understanding of this. The 1600s is a mash of stuff going on, right? The scientific revolution is happening 
right around the exact same time that the absolutist power is beginning to grow. Because the scientific revolution happens on the heels of the Renaissance, and all of that stuff kind of finally started like kind of coming to a little bit of a close-ish that you could refer to it as around the 1580s. And then starting in the 1600s, you have the growth of people like Sir Isaac Newton, who is a scientist, scientific thinker. Absolutists and kings and queens love to support the sciences because it makes their country a little bit more profitable. And if they discover something awesome, then they actually, of course, are going to be able to profit off of it, right? And the key thing that all absolutists wanted to do is they wanted to weaken the power of the nobles as much as possible so they could actually grow their own power. But what we're going to do right now is I'm going to clip in that old flip real quick. I'll see y'all soon. Keep up the hard work. Love what y'all are doing. Talk to you guys soon. The big thing, though, that all these leaders are doing, whether they are constitutional or whether they are absolutist, is they are supporting the destruction of noble power, right? For example, the noble in my house is my wife, right? She is definitely this noble that controls all this different stuff, and she's looking at me right now as if I'm like a turd or whatever. But I have to do my best to reduce her power so I can have more, right? Because I'm the monarch. I'm the king of this castle. Isn't that right, sweetheart? She said this is a matriarchy, actually, not a patriarchy, which is actually pretty true. She really does run the show. If anything, she's the queen, and I'm some, like, noble, and she wants to rep replace me with this dinky noble right here, Mr. Pee Pee. All right, so now look. You're a peasant. I'm a peasant? No, 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 no. Katie Skidari is a peasant. What? A thief. A thief is a plot of land, sweetheart. A person is not You're a thief. A fiefdom? A fiefdom is also another plot of land. Oh, what are they called? Surfs? Surfs. Surf. I'm a surf. There I'm you go. Surf. Look at that. My wife even knows what a surf is, right? It's a, not not my wife even. I'm not saying like she wasn't supposed to know it or whatever. I'm just saying she's wicked smart and then knowing what a surf is is very important in modern day society. Yes, yeah, like an insult. Yeah, so she can insult me and call me a surf, right? But it's okay, Skidari, we all know that you're the surf and so is Rodriguez. Now, the big thing about it, though, in general, is when we're looking at this thing as well, I love you. So, like, now, big thing, though, about it as well is we're going to focus our, like, actual, like, look, our <clears throat> magnifying glass, our first large, like, look at an absolutist monarchy in France, right? So let's go ahead and start off with the Bourbons, right? So the Bourbons are going to become the biggest monarchical family and the absolute monarchy family that is going to exist in France, right? So with that, you got to understand some little elements of these different ideas, right? So the Bourbons are going to come to power under, under none other than Henry IV. Now remember, we talked about Henry IV already. Henry IV is the guy that waged the fifth through the seventh, or the, wait, fourth through the seventh, French wars of religion, right? I know that Olivia remembered that really well when we came in. We talked about it, but we had to make sure because Olivia called me out on my mix-up and stuff like that. And like in my uh, last flip, Henry the Fourth is that same guy that converted from Protestantism to Catholicism, then converted back, then converted back again. Because remember, never forget that Paris is worth a mass, right? Henry the Fourth is going to become the leader of the French royalty and going to become the king of France, and he's also going to be known as Henry the Great for his ability to stop the French wars of religion and to pass a very important document known as the Edict of Nantes. And the Edict of Nantes, of course, said that Protestants could freely practice if they so chose and that no city in like Paris or in France should be suppressing the practice of any other religion, right? So the other big thing that you need to understand about it is his wife's name is Marie. De Medici. Wait a minute, not Margaret. Some of you are like, wait a minute, I'm confused. I understand Paris is worth a mass and all that stuff, and that this guy wrote the Edict of Nantes and that he brought like an end to a lot of very long periods of violence in like France. But I thought he was married to Margaret, not Marie. Well, the thing about it was, is after he becomes king, after he becomes Henry the Fourth of France, he actually annuls his marriage to Margaret Valois because he's not having any children with her, and instead gets married to a different woman named Marie de Medici, who apparently is not one of the brightest bulbs in the box, and she's also very annoying, according to many different sources and many different people, right? The big thing about it, though, in general, is that he does end up having several children with Marie de Medici, and going forward, the other big thing that you need to know is that he's very famous for saying, I refuse to rule over a country that does not have a chicken in every pot, right? So a big thing about Henry is he is going to come along and he's going to directly act in some very deliberate ways to try and curry favor with the poor, right? So we have some of our like poorer populations of people in Europe who aren't eating as often. The little ice age is ending and stuff like that. The famines of the 30 years war are going to be a really big deal. But when Henry comes to power, the 30 years war hasn't even started yet, right? He actually dies in 1610. And then of course, what's going to end up happening by 1618 is 
is the Thirty Years' War is going to begin. But he is in power during the Little Ice Age, so he like promulgates in a pamphlet and a lot of series of different pamphlets saying, I want a chicken in every pot, right? That he wants to feed the people of France. He's going to have new roads and canals built to increase the infrastructure. He's going to lower taxes deliberately on poorer population and the uh, poorer populations of France. And this is going to earn him that moniker, Henry the Great, right? Because he does a lot of things to help them out. Now, an interesting little thing, though, that some of you are probably thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute. What king has ever grown their power by lowering taxes? That doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. Well, it's more along the lines of who he's lowering them on. He lowered taxes on the poor and impoverished because of the little ice age and the famines that were being caused. And he also replaces it with a new form of taxation, a taxation form known as the Paulette, right? Paulette is not a name. It's a type of tax, right? And the, what this is is basically... Henry IV started selling royal offices, right? He started being like, oh, are you a wealthy family? Would you like to buy into an office? Would you like to then pass that office down to your sons and make it hereditary? Whether it be tax assessor, magistrate, judge, certain types of bishoprics. Like if you could be a bishop, you could actually sell the office of a bishopric because ever since Francis I, and they could appoint their own bishops. Like So like you could actually sell the office of bishopric to somebody else and a family would actually be able to lock it up for a certain time period. Now, when he does this, he actually creates a new type of nobility in France, and they call themselves the nobles of the robe, right? Or robe nobles, if you want to call it that. But it ends up making him a ton of money, so he can go off and fight some other wars should he need to, right? But the big thing that's going to end up happening to Henry is by the end of his reign, he rules for about like 20-ish years, give or take. And what's end up going to ha or going to end up happening, though, is by 1610, he is assassinated, right? He does not die a natural death. He's actually stabbed to death by a Catholic cardinal, right? Or no, like a Catholic fanatic, right? A Catholic fanatic dives into his carriage head first through the window and stabs him to death, right? Now, what ends up happening, though, is his young son king, not son king, ooh, no, whoa, whoa, don't get confused with that, sorry, pretend I didn't say that, rewind it, cut it out, don't say that, his young son is going to become king. Some of you are like, why is him saying son king such a big deal? Because the other guy later on is going to be the son king, and he's very, very important, right? Now, the big thing about it, though, going into it is you need to understand his very, very young son is going to be named Louis the Thirteenth, right? So Louis the Thirteenth is going to come to power, but the issue was that he was only eight years old, right? He was only eight years old, and he's going to be used... Like, as a, well, not used, but he's going to be viewed as a very, very weak king, right? His actual, like, advisor, his queen regent, was his mom, Marie de Medici, which we just said earlier is super annoying and not very smart, right? Like, so, which is a very, very dangerous combination of things to be ruling for your young son, right? Marie de Medici is also going to use her young son to try and, like, curry some favor with the Austrians. Uh, he is going to actually get married to a woman named Anne of Austria by an arranged marriage and stuff like that. And another big thing that's going to happen is underneath his young reign whenever he comes to power he's going to come to power at eight and then by 1614 they're having to call this big meeting right known as the estates general because he's only 12 years old what the estates general is is it's a meeting for an emergency crisis in france right and so in 1614 when louis the 13th comes to power they have to call this estates general which is kind of like an emergency parliament now, with that, though, they do this to try and figure out taxation, how to keep the nobles from rioting and revolting, and doing a number of other different things as well. But also, a big thing is that the third estate in France wants to lower taxes, right? They just want to lower taxes on some of the people. But what ends up going down in this whole process is it really demonstrates and shows Marie de Medici's weaknesses, right? She's not a very good queen regent. She's actually kind of manipulative as well, and she's trying to get, like, Louis the Thirteenth to only listen to what she says. And a lot of other nobles start whispering spring into Louis the 13th's ear and what ends up happening eventually is Maria de Medici is actually exiled out of the city by a young King Louis when he comes to the age of 13 years old right and so what ends up happening though is a despondent Louis who's now exiled his mother and stuff like that is actually going to have to turn to somebody to be his advisor because what 13 year old is going to be a good king right and the guy he turns to is none other than Cardinal Richelieu the real true leader during Louis, Louis the Thirteenth's reign, right? So when Louis the Thirteenth comes to power, he's very, very weak. He's easily manipulated, and he's also easily manipulated by his mom, right? Actually, at one point, Marie de Medici, like they like got back together for a little while. Like Louis the Thirteenth, like actually started talking to his mom, Marie de Medici, again for a little while. And there was this really, really famous event in 1630 called the Day of the Dupes, and like dupes means like stupid people. Um, so and what ended up happening is Marie de Medici 
First of all, only reason that she was allowed to talk to Louis XIII again is because Cardinal Richelieu convinced him to be like, hey, look, man, it's your mom, you know what I mean? Maybe y'all can mediate this and figure it out. And then Marie de Medici shows back up and it's just like, well, Cardinal Richelieu's a big stupid head and you should listen to me instead of him. And then, like, Louis XIII exiled or got rid of Cardinal Richelieu for less than a day. Like, did it for less than a day and then was like, I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm sorry. Like, so... That's how weak Louis the Thirteenth was. Cardinal Richelieu, on the other hand, is a very, very strong leader, right? Very pragmatic, very, very smart, wildly intelligent. Has been a bishop since a very, very young age because his family is one of those Paulette families, right? Their family actually owned the bishopric for like of uh, this one area in like Laurent or something like that, or some city in France. And so, what ends up happening though is Cardinal Richelieu comes to power as Louis the Thirteenth's chief minister, right? And when he comes to power, he starts a series of different reforms to try and give Louis as much power by default, also giving himself more power. Because in the long run, when you want to make the argument, Cardinal Richelieu was the real king of France during this time period of like French history, not so much Louis. Because Louis was focusing on something else. By the time Louis got to about 20 years old and he's now married to this woman named Anne of Austria, he's focusing mostly on trying to have a child. Because they keep trying to have kids over and over and over and over and over again, and they keep having miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage after failed pregnancy after death of a child following the birth. And like so he's really focused on trying to keep the Bourbon dynasty going and trying to just be not the worst king on the planet. And so Cardinal Cardinal Richelieu was really ruling for him instead. He comes to power, and of course, during this entire process, while Louis the King, Louis the Thirteenth was King of France, the Thirty Years' War has now begun. Right, eight years into his rulership, when Louis the Thirteenth was sixteen years old, is when the Thirty Years' War is going to start in sixteen eighteen. Now, looking at it as well, the Thirty Years' War is going to be raging, of course, for its first two phases: the Bohemian and Danish one, mostly isolated away in the Holy Roman Empire. But of course, Cardinal Richelieu, seeing the Catholic forces in the first two phases of the Thirty Years' War, gaining too much power and getting too many victories. It's not that he doesn't like that they're Catholic victories, he doesn't like that they're Habsburg victories, right? And so this actually becomes a very, very big moment in his like entire tenure as chief minister of like the entire French government because he becomes commander of France during that Thirty Years' War. And he starts deliberately funding those Protestant armies under Gustavus Adolphus to try and weaken the Habsburg family and give France more power and kind of reassort that kind of balance of power, right? Now in this whole process, Cardinal Richelieu becomes very, very popular in France, but very unpopular everywhere else, right? And another big reason why he becomes so popular in France is because he's trying to give more power to the king, right? A lot of locals and like very regular people in the middle class and merchants and guild workers and traders were really, really disgusted with how much power the nobles had, right? They didn't like how much power the nobles had because they were like, look, if I'm going to be ruled over by somebody, I'd rather it be like a good Machiavellian king. Honestly, like Richelieu is very Machiavellian in a sense. They were like, I'd rather be ruled over by somebody like that than be ruled over by somebody like my noble who could change at any minute and then also who like is also just not a good leader and is not very smart, right? So the thing about it is what Cardinal Richelieu comes along to do is he decides to try and replace the power of the nobles with a new system. And he creates this thing known as the intendant system, right? The intendant system is basically a setup network, a bureaucratic multi-level government setup network where every single region of France would have what's known as an intendant, right? And the intendants would do whatever the king told them to do, right? Giving a crap load of power to the Bourbon monarchy and to the monarchs at the time, right? The intendant system also went against an old system that already existed in France known as the Parlements, which sound like the most French thing you've ever heard of in your entire life. Parlement. And some of you are like, don't you mean Parliament? No, I mean Parlement, because that's what they called it. And you don't want it to get confused with the British Parliament, right? So the big thing about it, though, is the intended system actually went directly against the Parlements, because what was the Parlements? The Parlements were these councils of nobles that actually wrote everything the king said into law. Basically giving the Parlements a little bit of power over the king, because they could just choose not to listen to them. And be like, oh, we didn't write it today, we'll write it next week. Oh, we didn't write it today, we'll write it next week. And so what ends up happening, though, is the intendants carry the word of the king directly to the people, rather than depending on the parlements to write these laws into power, right? So what he's going to do also is he's going to destroy Protestant communities. He's going to go and wage war directly on the city of La Rochelle. And in this very, very famous painting of him, he's just being an absolute boss, right? Known as the Crimson, like, wait, what was he called? What was he called? Like, he was like the Crimson Bishop or something like that. Ugh, he had a nickname because of the, that red robe that he wore all the time. Uh, Richelieu. Crimson, all right, so Crimson nickname. 
All right, so, like, what was his name? Hang on. Sorry, I had to look it up. He was known as his Red Eminence, right? Red Eminence because of the red robe that he wore. And look at him right now just crossing his arms and watching the destruction of a French city, right? Like, he literally is destroying the French city of La Rochelle because the Huguenot nobles there were gaining too much power, and he wanted to install intendants and also prevent and expel the English intervention. So an interesting little thing is that these are English boats out in the water that are trying to help Protestants in La Rochelle. And this dude doesn't even care. And he's got literally these, like, other car these bishops over here here, holding his hat for him while he watches the city get destroyed. This dude is aggressive. He sides with Adolphus to ruin the uh, to weaken the Habsburgs, and in the entire process, he even picks all of the people that hang out with Louis the Thirteenth firsthand. Picks his friends for him so they will advance the powers of the king rather than the powers of the nobles. He also, uh, multiple times, people try to assassinate him, like multiple different times. But the only reason that no one ever gets to him or assassinates him is because he has a network of spies inside of the royal court that will actually keep him safe, and that raises the question, is Cardinal Richelieu like a good or a bad guy? It's really, really hard to actually kind of make that decision because he like killed a bunch of his own people, but he also weakened the Habsburgs. And he also like sided with Gustavus Adolphus, which was a very, very big Protestant leader who was going to come along and try to like tip the like balance of power. But then he also kind of supplanted the power of the king at the exact same time. So it's a very, very interesting little thing. And also, fun fact, the front of his face was stolen at one point. So when he died eventually in 1642, this is actually his face. They actually took his head off of his like, body, mummified it, and then replaced it and buried him with it. But in the French Revolution, someone stole it. And they eventually got it back in the 1890s and stuff like that. But that is literally Cardinal Richelieu's mummified head that was stolen during the French Revolution. Now, the other interesting thing that's going on right now as well is that what is going on? We need to understand this. We've got multiple different types of nobles, right? So something that we need to understand really quickly. I just earlier was talking about Henry IV and the creation of the robe nobility, right? Well, let's chat really, really quickly about what the difference between these robe nobles and sword nobles that Cardinal Richelieu is trying to weaken their power, right? So the robe nobles are the ones who bought their way into office. They're like the new guys on the streets. They are not based in tradition. They purchased an office, and that's how they were allowed to have it. It was a one-time payment, and they actually were allowed to collect taxes and actually do all these other different things, and were very prominent figures figures throughout most of European or French history. Now, why are they so powerful? Due to the fact that they have a very large, prestigious position in society. They can help collect taxes, and they don't pay much of them at all. Now, what about the sword nobles? The sword nobles are the other type of nobility that hates the idea that the power of the king is growing at all. They are not fans of this whatsoever, because sword nobles earned their nobility through military service to the king, right? They earned their nobility through military service and they didn't want to give up any of their power, right? But why are they so powerful? Because they control militaries. Well, the thing about it is Richelieu is going to reduce their power and the intendants are going to cut out much of that power and Richelieu is going to replace many of them in court with lower ranked robes. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Terry. Are you saying that the robe nobles were used to replace all the sword nobles uh, it's kind of a little bit of both, right? It's a little bit hard to explain, but basically what was going on is that there were some super powerful robe nobles by this point because this created this office was created in like the 15, like 1600s by Henry IV, right? So by this point in history, by 50 years later, there were some super powerful robe nobles and some really powerful sword nobles. And so what Richelieu is going to do is he's going to replace all those powerful nobles with just fresh off the street robe nobles that have just bought their way into office and have been lower ranked. We talked about this a little bit in class yesterday when we were discussing like, oh, replace a powerful noble with a weaker noble and the noble's power will be dependent on the king, right? So the big thing about it though in general is that Richelieu is going to replace the powerful robe nobles and sword nobles with a lot of these weaker robe nobles that are coming along a little bit later. Now really quickly though, what's going to end up happening as well is that Richelieu and Louis XIII are going to die within a year of each other, right? It's almost like Louis XIII just couldn't do his job without the guy, right? In 1642, Richelieu is going to die and his face is going to be mummified and all that stuff's going to happen. But then 1643, Louis XIII is going to die, leaving this little chunky chunk 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 child on the throne like to do, what are you doing? There we go. To do his bidding, right? That right there is the most famous absolutist king that has ever existed. And his name is Louis the 14th, right? Louis Dudon is what his name actually is, right? So like Dudon means gift of God. And some of you are all like, but wait a minute, I thought Louis the 13th couldn't have had kids. They finally had one successfully, right? Him and his wife, Anne of Austria, finally got together and had 
one surviving child. And they named him Louis Dudon due to the fact that Dudon means gift of God, right? Like so, and Louis Dudon comes to power at the age of four. Like so, like four years old, he becomes king after the death of his father, Louis the Thirteenth. But the thing about it is, just like Louis the Thirteenth, this guy can't rule. He's four years old. So who's gonna rule instead? Well, who's gonna rule is his mom. Anne of Austria, who's way better and way better of a ruler than Marie de Medici was. Very smart, very pragmatic, and then also he's going to have another chief minister. The one that was trained by Cardinal Richelieu, named Cardinal Mazarin. Now, I have a little heart right here because word on the street is that these two were hooking up, right? Like, so there's a word on the street that these two were actually had a very nefarious relationship and all this other stuff going on. But what we're going to do is we're going to cut the flip right there and we're going to talk a lot about the Sun King and stuff like that, Louis Dudon and his rise to power in class. But I'll see y'all then. Y'all have a good one.